see how that works out. So thank you so much uh, for being here today uh, to talk about the Coast Guard Academy Scholars Program. I see some familiar names on here, uh, even a couple people from my first boat, Ian Oviat. How's it going? Long time no see. Shout out to you. I'm um, really happy to have uh, the folks interested in these webinars. Um, want to keep these going, and we'll take any suggestions for future topics. So um, thanks for coming online with us. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Coast Guard Academy Scholars Program. We're going to try to keep the conversation to about 30 minutes in length. Um, so when the 30 minute uh, mark hits, what will happen is at that point, I'll kind of, um, I'll, I'll look around for more questions. If no one has anything at that point, uh, you're welcome to log off at that time. Um, but that will officially kind of end our webinar portion. Um, and then we can stick around for any additional Q&A uh, for a few minutes after that. So um, for your awareness, if you're looking at the screen, you should be able to see my face and also off in the corner over there, Mr. Chris McMunn. Um, I'll back up in a little bit and let him uh, take a bit more of the spotlight and he'll go on mic as well. So hopefully that will work and we'll just want to test that out. Um, once that's all set, uh, then uh, if you are participating in the conversation, um, you will want to click on the little I am thought bubble on the bottom left hand corner of your screen and then you can type into the chat. Um, so I can see everybody's name as they're typing. Um, if you can't see the video of me, I do apologize. There could be a chance that either your application uh, or the link itself might not allow uh, for your for the video access, but at least you'll be able to hear me and you'll be able to see the presentation. So with that, we're about four minutes into our 1600 meeting. I don't want to steal any more time away from him. So I'm going to go back on mute and let Mr. Chris McMahon introduce himself and start his presentation. Thanks so much. Welcome, Chris. Sorry, so now hopefully everybody can hear me. I think I'm on my mic. Somebody can at least type to confirm. Yeah, you're on. Great, thanks. So for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet, uh, my name is Chris McMahon. I'm a 97 graduate of the Academy. I'm the Associate Director for Operations. So my staff and I do all the application review and selection and enrollment of our class, as well as the Scholars Program. Uh, and I also have administrative responsibility for the one-year prep school program. So you are getting a little bit of the JV team today. Lieutenant Marty Rivera, who is the Scholars Program Manager, uh, is on leave, so she was unable to join us. But I'm going to do my best to fill in, give her presentation, and obviously answer any questions that you guys have. So I did provide a copy of this presentation to Alex, so anyone that wants it, uh, no, no big need to take notes or anything if you're following along. And it does stand, uh, stand alone pretty good. So if you have questions, you're welcome to get in touch with us. But I will just get right started. Um, so I see the slide advanced on my screen. Hopefully everyone is on slide two now. OK, well, I have both the slide on mine and Alex's now. So hopefully that means everyone's looking at the second slide, which says history and program goals at the top of it. Um, our one-year preparatory school program started back in the late 70s. We only used the Naval Academy Prep School at the time, so it was just named by default the NAPS program. Uh, in the mid to late 90s, we did combine it with an existing uh, Coast Guard Recruiting Command program, which was called SEGRET, the Coast Guard Recruiting Initiative for the 21st Century. That was basically where we sent students to one year at civilian colleges around the U.S. Um, and then we also sent some students to NAPS, but the goal was to get them here to the academy the following year. Uh, in the early 2000s, we sort of merged both of those programs into one here at the academy and renamed it the Coast Guard Academy Scholar Program. Um, it was also during that time that we began transitioning away from using the Naval Academy Prep School to using only those civilian junior colleges with Military Academy Prep uh, programs built in. We used a number of them over the years, um, eventually landing with the ones that we are using now, which is Marion Military Institute and Georgia Military College. We also returned two years ago with a pilot program at the Naval Academy Prep School. So those are the three institutions that we are now sending our students to. 
Um, you can see the Commandant instruction at the bottom, which basically uh, gives us the regulation and instructions for our scholars program. But the overall purpose of it is really to allow us to diversify the incoming cadets that we have at the academy and in order to prepare them with the uh, STEM degrees. Uh, as some of you may have known, the Academy is the primary producer of Coast Guard officers with uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, undergraduate degrees. We do get some through the Officer Candidate School program and other commissioning sources, but that really does make up mostly non-STEM majors. So, anywhere on the screen. Sorry, doing some double clicking duties here, but hopefully you're seeing a slide that says selection to the CGAS program. Uh, there is no special application or way to be considered for the prep school program. The only way is to apply directly to the academy. Those records are read by our cadet candidate evaluation board, and if it looks like they need a little bit of academic or other prep before coming to the academy, uh, that cadet candidate evaluation board will recommend them for the scholars program. Um, all those records are sent over to Lieutenant Marvy Rivera for review. Uh, on average, we do get between five and 600 applicants that are recommended for prep school consideration. So in any given year, that makes up about a quarter of the applications that we receive. Um, we're going to be tendering uh, between 85 and 100 appointments to that program in order to get the 65 to 70 individuals that will actually enroll in the program. Um, as you can see, their academic credentials are just slightly below those that we're bringing into the class. Uh, that makes sense since the primary purpose of the program is to help them out academically um, and everything else really applies. So for the most part, it's somebody that we'd love to bring to the academy. You know, we like their leadership, we like their extracurriculars, uh, we like their overall character. They need to be medically qualified, they need to meet the same PFE and height weight compliance that people coming to the academy do. This just gives us an additional year to work with them and bring up their academic preparation. Hopefully you all are seeing a slide with system statistics on our current cohort that are wrapping up their prep year. So actually over the next three weeks is when our groups that are at Marion Military Institute, Georgia Military College, and at the Naval Academy Prep School will be graduating and completing their one year prep. But last summer we enrolled 70 into the program 57 of them are still sort of alive and kicking, um, and we don't know if all of them will be successful. Some are on the bubble academically, and it will come down to how they do on final exams and things like that. But, you know, we're really optimistic that, you know, 57, if not close to that number, will be joining us in July with the class of 2022. But you can just see some of the overall statistics. This is fairly normal in terms of the cohort that we are bringing in. There are no quotas for this program, similar to no quotas for the class we're bringing into the academy. Um, but in any given year, we are looking to bring in a pretty diverse class to the scholars since they are going to represent a year later kind of the nucleus or the start of the uh, next incoming class at the academy. So hopefully everyone is seeing a slide about the summer orientation. This is the brief kind of mini swab summer uh, boot camp, if you will, that we do for these students in advance of them reporting to their individual prep schools. So they're at the academy either for three weeks if they're going to Georgia Military College or Marion Military Institute, or they're here for about 10 days before going to the Naval Academy Prep School. So during that time, they have to complete a lot of required military accession training since we are enlisting them actually in the Coast Guard as E2s for the purpose of pay and benefits during that one year program. They do a little bit of uh, range familiarization just with, you know, the weapons our law enforcement teams use. They get a lot of uh, briefings from our legal office and including our SARC just regarding, again, primarily Coast Guard regulations that do apply to them as military members. Uh, they take our PFE, they do a swimming assessment, they go on our uh, visual simulator, do some fun stuff down at the waterfront. They meet the Commandant of Cadets, the Dean of Academics, our superintendent, a bunch of other people while they're here. But really, they just spend a lot of time together, very similar to Swab Summer, kind of gelling as a cohort, getting to know each other, doing a bunch of team building. Um, and then after they do report to their individual schools, they have an in-doc period, if you will, or their own school's version of Swab Summer, uh, plebe, in-doc, and things like that. 
So they're not quite done when they leave the academy. And the SARC is Sexual uh, Assault Response Coordinator, UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice. Yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you guys are seeing a slide titled August through May. This is all the fun stuff that happens when they depart the academy's orientation and actually get to their individual prep schools. So the programs vary slightly depending which institution that they're at, but these are some of the highlights and things that all of them will obviously take part in. So we visit and check in on them quite a bit. We like to uh, be able to see them at least every four to six weeks, and that could be the Scholars Support Chief. That's currently uh, Chief Hamilton, for those of you that may know some of the staff. She is retiring this summer. She's gonna be relieved by uh, Chief uh, Rosen, who's coming to us from Coast Guard headquarters. So excited to get her on board this summer. Uh, Lieutenant Marvie Rivera uh, will remain the Scholars Program Coordinator for next year and, and possibly even a year after that, depending on uh, what she's interested in doing. But she has at least one year left with us here in the office. Um, they do a lot of physical training. They take PFEs pretty routinely. As enlisted members, they do semi-annual weigh-ins in October and April. We do random urinalysis on them, so a lot of the stuff they do is the same any junior enlisted member would do regardless of where they are assigned. Um, they take some prep classes for the ACT and SAT. Uh, we do require them to retest at least once during the year, but there is no requirement to improve. Um, some of that is just to help the prep schools validate their classes as well as the students learn a little bit more and be overall prepared to be successful when they come to the academy. Um, we have a lot of professional development opportunities as well, so they do visit some Coast Guard units in their local areas, um, so that could include, you know, air stations, sector small boat stations, and larger cutters as well. Um, they can participate in a wide range of extracurricular club activities at their individual schools, so I know there are, um, you know, flight programs are big at Marion Military Institute, for example. Um, all of them have sports programs, either competing at that junior college level or uh, NAPS is kind of a, a standalone as a military prep school. But those that play sports usually can continue participating in their sports if they want to. All the students at the Naval Academy Prep School uh, do go down for sort of Army-Navy week um, in Annapolis and ultimately attend the Army-Navy game wherever that's being held, so that's a lot of fun for them. Um, at Georgia Military College and Marion Military Institute, we have a kind of a formal winter dinner just to celebrate the end of kind of the first term. We get both cohorts together as well, so that's a nice chance for them to reconnect. Uh, they haven't seen each other for the most part since orientation. Um, we do something for NAPS as well. We just aren't able to get them down to visit with the other students. And there are a couple occasions through the year when we bring them up to the academy as well for some uh, events in the spring just to reconnect with us here in New London. Um, and it isn't, uh, it isn't in uncommon for the superintendent or other senior leadership here from the academy to actually visit the prep schools and touch base with the students as well. So there's a lot that we, we pack into that sort of 10-month program, but there's a little bit of fun. And like all students, they find a way on spring break or otherwise to take advantage of morale opportunities. Uh, so just a little bit on paying allowances, if you are working with individuals that are accepted to the scholars program and they have questions, um, just to give you a foundation. So again, they are enlisted as active duty Coast Guard members uh, at the E2. They're paid as somebody with less than two years service, so it's approximately $700 base pay per month. So they're paid actually almost double what cadets make when they're here at the academy. So that's a little bit of an adjustment for some of them. They actually are being paid less when they come to the academy than they were in prep school. Um, if they are prior enlisted uh, coming from the fleet and they happen to already be an E3 or sometimes we have some that are E4s, um, they will retain their rank so they don't have to take a pay cut or any loss of benefits by virtue of coming into the program. Um, those that are at Georgia Military College and Marion Military Institute they are paid uh, BAH and BAS, that's a housing and subsistence allowance, just in line with as any enlisted member would. Um, but that money actually goes directly to the prep school. So it is paid to the scholars, and then each month, just like any college student would, they write a check to the bursar or the financial aid office at their individual schools to pay for their tuition, room and board, and all that fun stuff. Uh, NAPS, those uh, allowances actually go just directly to the Navy because they are providing their housing and they are providing their subsistence via the galley since NAPS is an actual 
uh, military base, Georgia Military College and Mary Military Institute, again, are just accredited junior colleges, so they're civilian institutions. Um, in addition to that, all the students get a one-time uh, clothing allowance. It's about $1,000. That does help them pay for their Coast Guard uniforms, in addition to any uh, school-specific uniforms that they'll have to buy at their institution. Um, and again, I see there's a note at the bottom that, they, yeah, all the pay does go directly to the scholars. In the past, there was a little bit of a middleman kind of collecting some of those funds here at the academy, and then we would distribute it to the prep schools. Uh, but in alignment with some of those things going away for the cadets and the cadets getting all their pay to distribute as they need, our scholars are the same. They get all their pay and allowances and they distribute them directly as they need to. So getting into the fun stuff a little bit, um, towards the end of the year, obviously we're looking to appoint as many of these individuals as we can. So the appointment and retention criteria should be up on the screen now. Um, so their first semester or trimester, they need to maintain at least a 2.0 grade point average in their core courses. So that's basically their math, their science, uh, their English courses, and then there are some others that we bolt on just for fun to make them, uh, them well-rounded academically, and they uh, can't fail any courses as well. So Georgia Military College and the Naval Academy Prep School are actually on a trimester. So as they finish up that second trimester, they need a 2.25 uh, cumulative grade point average with no failing grades to remain in the program. Uh, and then finally, all the institutions, they students need to have a 2.5 uh, cumulative GPA to remain in the program with no failing grades. Uh, as you can see right below that, a 3.0 cumulative GPA is actually what kind of guarantees them academically that they will be appointed to the academy. 2.5 to 2.9, they're sort of leaving it up to the director's discretion. Um, it is very common that we appoint everybody within that, um, but at the same time, they're, they're kind of, again, handing their fate over by not getting that 3.0. That is what's going to guarantee them. Um, but again, it's very common that we appoint as many, if not all, of the individuals that fall in that 2.5 to 2.9 criteria. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, they need to maintain their physical fitness, having at least 165 points on our PFE. Uh, they need to remain height and weight compliant, as well as remaining medically qualified or receiving medical waivers for any disqualifying conditions that may occur during the course of their prep year. Uh, and just like all the incoming cadets here, they need to have that kind of character, morals and ethics, and leadership component, not having had any issues um, being recommended, if you will, by their prep schools to be appointed to the academy. Um, so I think we only have one or two more slides, but these are just some of the uh, big issues pitfalls, problem areas that we see people fall into. Um, we're very fortunate that we don't have any major problems, just, just like the incoming class, though. They are, you know, 17 to 18, 19-year-olds, so sometimes they make mistakes. Hopefully, they're little ones that we can remediate and, and teach them and get them ready to be successful here at the Academy. But sometimes they are, you know, pretty egregious or big things that will lead to them being removed for the program. But alcohol is definitely the number one. The vast majority of students we bring into the program are under age, so they should not be consuming alcohol uh, in any ways. But even the ones that are of age, they obviously you know, need to be uh, drinking responsibly and at appropriate times in the program. A lot of our prior enlisted members are older by virtue of having been on active duty for a few years, so they are often of age. Um, so uh, they're surrounded by other students in these prep programs that are not on active duty. The other service academies that are sponsoring students at these institutions, with the exception of NAPS, uh, they're not on active duty. So they're not held to that same uh, uniform code of military justice or the higher standard. They're really just civilian college students that are wearing a uniform for the year versus our students who are actually on active duty wearing the uniform because they're in the military. Um, there have been some instances of sexual harassment, our students being the victims, not the aggressors, if you will, but it is something that we've encountered on occasion at these institutions. Um, in addition to infrequent issues of uh, hazing, um, these are two-year programs for the most part, so a lot of times the upper class, if you will, that are doing the in-doc program or leading these uh, cadet corps at the civilian institutions, you know, they're just 17 and 18-year-olds 
So we have had isolated incidents that we've had to deal with with these uh, students. It's obviously something that we don't tolerate here at the academy, so we're not going to tolerate it at the other institutions that we're sending our students to. Um, academics is, is the primary thing our students run into trouble with. That's obviously why they're at prep school, so it's not surprising that sometimes that causes them problems. But really, there's a ton of academic resources. It's, I would say, almost as robust as we offer here at the academy. That's why we chose those institutions. The big problem is the students not being willing to ask for help or not identifying that they need help early enough. Um, so they do have academic advisors and a lot of support structures in place to help them. But just like the cadets here at the academy, they have to know how to ask for help, and then they have to know to take advantage of those things when they're offered. Uh, it's very rare people would have height or weight or fitness issues. Sometimes they do have medical disqualifications come up during the year. We get as many of them waivers as we can. Uh, and then the last issue that we, we've really combated, I think, well in recent years is just sort of non-identity or feeling disconnected from the Coast Guard. There is a pretty heavy Army feel to a lot of these institutions, obviously a very heavy Navy feel to the Naval Academy Prep School, um, but we think we touch base with them quite a bit, keep them connected, get them to our campus or Coast Guard units as much as we can. Um, so that is something we feel that has uh, improved in recent years compared to, uh, you know, five or certainly ten years ago when we first were starting these programs. Okay, so the goal is obviously to get as many of them here to the academy as we can. Um, so 80 to 85 percent is our goal. Some years we exceed that. Some years we are not able to. This year we're right at about 82 percent, so we're sort of right in the sweet spot and hoping to retain as many of those people for these final weeks as they take their final exams and just get through graduation, which occurs in May for all those institutions. Um, and in any given year, they do usually make up 15 to 18 percent of our incoming class here at the academy. Uh, we monitor that pretty closely. We would never sort of want it to exceed 20 percent just because that limits opportunity, obviously, for our direct applicants that are applying from high school or other colleges. Um, so we do enroll an appropriate number based on the class size next year at the academy. So I am getting the high five sign from Alex. I'm assuming that's just like you're doing an awesome job, but I think he's also telling me we're down to our sort of uh, Q&A time, which is great because this is the last slide. Uh, this is Lieutenant Marvie Rivera and Chief Deborah Hamilton, again, the current uh, program manager and support chief, um, as well as our website. If you're interested, in addition to this presentation of going online and just learning a little bit more about the programs, their contact information is there as well. So that is my time, or close to it, uh, and my presentation. So I'm happy to now take any questions that you all have, and I'm also happy to stay uh, a little bit beyond the allotted time if somebody had questions and wanted to continue the dialogue a little past the uh, 30 minutes that we reserved. So thanks, Alex. I don't know what's involved in, in the Q&A part, but I'm ready to answer. Okay. I know you all right, great. So we just heard from uh, Mr. Chris McVon, Operations Branch, representing our Coast Guard Academy Scholars Program. If anyone has any questions this time, uh, go ahead, type them into your chat window there, and we would be happy to answer those for you. We've got about four more minutes in our allotted time. We started a little bit late, so we can go past that by a couple minutes. Um, but just let us know if you have anything at all. All right, so first question, um, and we'll kind of toggle back and forth here on the mics. Uh, first question that we had come in is, do we ever lose pros prospective Coast Guard Academy students to the Navy when they go to NAPS? Sure, so I'm uh, unmuted, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, so yeah, part of going to the Naval Academy Prep School and part of our uh, uh, memorandum of understanding with them is that we won't sort of uh, poach uh, students, if you will, from each other. So again, our students, by virtue of going to the scholars program, are not obligated to come to the academy the next year. I don't remember if that was covered in the presentation or not. They obviously still have free will. Um, they can just decline the appointment, just like everybody else can, even if they earn it at the end of the year. But with the Naval Academy specifically, those students at NAPS, um, should they decide not to enroll at the Coast Guard Academy, they'd have to wait at least one year. So they could not immediately go to the Naval Academy. But if they declined our appointment, 
went to a civilian school or did something else out in the world, they could certainly then apply to the Naval Academy and go to that institution the following year. Uh, and there are no similar restrictions at the other academies. Um, I can only think of really one or two individuals who have declined their appointments after completing the scholars program. There's, these are all pretty intelligent people. There's much easier ways to get a year of college paid for. Um, so most of them are enthusiastic about coming to the academy and serving in the Coast Guard. So. Great. Um, next question up there, I see, and we kind of touched on it, was the prep students not appointed to CGA, must they fulfill the remi remainder of their enlisted time? And you kind of already hit on that a little bit. No, uh, so if students are, they are enlisted in the Coast Guard on a two-year contract, but should they not be appointed to the academy, um, they are not obligated to serve uh, the remaining year on their enlisted contract. They are released with honorable discharges as long as there wasn't anything dishonorable, which led to them not being appointed to the academy. Um, so there is a little bit of a pathway if they want to actually remain enlisted in the Coast Guard, but since they had that little mini boot camp here at the academy, they would actually need to complete sort of real boot camp at Cape May. Um, but there are some pathways for them to remain enlisted if they want to do so. The majority of them just sort of are discharged from the Coast Guard, go off and complete their college education somewhere else. Great. And uh, we're at our 430 mark. Uh, absolutely no obligation for folks to stay on past the 430. Mr. McMahon has graciously offered his time to stay a little bit later. So uh, if you do want, wish to stick around for these questions, please do so. Uh, our next question here. What is the graduation rate for scholars? Is it higher, lower, or equal to uh, the non-scholar or direct appointments to the academy? Sure. So uh, scholars, graduates, actually, uh, they retain um, at a little bit of a higher rate than their non-scholar classmates here at the academy during the first two years. And then they actually retain a little lower than their uh, non-scholars classmates during the last two years. So it actually evens out that the graduation rate is almost exactly the same if you were a scholar's graduate or a non-scholar's graduate. So again, they do a little bit better during swap summer and during fourth class year. It's rare if actually we lose any scholars during the first year or even the second year. And then a couple of them may begin to struggle academically or just you know have other interests as all the cadets do as they get sort of towards the end of their time at the academy. But yes, graduation rate is right on par with non-scholars in terms of the four-year experience. Great. Uh, Ms. Simco asks, uh, my daughter went to MMI as a self-prep. Is there an advantage to going to one of the self-prep schools over the others as a self-prep student? Uh, sure. So. For those of you that haven't heard the term uh, self-prep before, it is sort of just um, civilian students that are going to Marion Military Institute, uh, Georgia Military College, uh, Northwestern Prep, Valley Forge. There's a number of these, uh, New Mexico Military Institute. There's a number of these sort of institutions around the U.S. which run these service academy prep programs. Um, I would not say there's sort of a overt uh, advantage to going to Marion Military Institute or George Military College compared to another one. Um, there is the sort of just, um, you know, there is the advantage that we visit those schools quite a bit. Um, obviously, we administer the PFE, um, and there are some of those things that are just part of being at those schools that you wouldn't get just because we don't visit New Mexico Military Institute or Valley Forge. So, I mean, we think the academic prep would be comparable. Um, all we have to really judge, though, is the self preps at the schools that we visit. Um, on average, we get 20 to 25 self-preps apply from Marion Military Institute each year. We get a handful that apply from Georgia Military College and those other civilian programs around the U.S. Um, so, yeah, on average, I'd say about a third to some years as high as half of those self-preps from Marion ultimately get appointments. But there's really no way of knowing if they also would have got appointed if they just went to the University of Alabama or they went to the University of Connecticut or they went somewhere else to continue their education and reapply to the academy. So we have definitely a lot of opinions on that topic. And uh, I think they have the advantage of, again, taking the PFE, meeting with staff when we go down. And we obviously think they do a good job prepping since we send our sponsored preps there. But yeah, there's no obligation to go there. We have a ton of successful reapplies from all around the U.S. Great. We have a few more questions. Uh, if a scholar receives a general scholarship, 
from the high school, can that be applied to the costs of the prep school program? Yes. Um, so any scholarships that they receive coming out of high school, just like they can apply them to appropriate expenses here at the academy, they can also apply them to appropriate expenses at the prep schools. And so that would obviously allow the scholars to keep a little bit more money in their pockets if they're able to pay for, you know, tuition expenses out of those scholarships or if they're able to, if they did have a scholarship that paid for, you know, room and board and things of that nature, yes, they would still get those allowances and that would allow them to keep a little bit more money in their pocket just like the cadets can do here if they have funds available from outside. Excellent. Uh, do individuals coming from the illicit side have to be under 22 years old? Yes, so the uh, requirement does not change for incoming cadets here at the academy, which is being 17 to 22 years old when they begin their training here at the Coast Guard Academy. So just kind of subtracting a year off of that, that does mean that students that are entering the prep school need to be 17 to 21 years old in order to remain eligible. Um, they can't be 16, even though they're superstars and maybe graduating from high school early, just because they do need to be 17 to come on to active duty in the military. Great. And the last question I see here uh, is, what is the pay scale for fourth class cadets? Sure. So um, fourth class cadets are actually paid the same as first class cadets. It just depends on how many uh, expenses or other things they owe the academy. So that's how much they actually get to keep. So all the incoming cadets here at the academy take what's called an initial clothing allowance. It's essentially a $10,000 advance on their pay that they pay off monthly over their first two years at the academy. There's some other allotments that they give to the academy to pay for athletic expenses, to pay for their laundry, their haircuts. So all these things that the cadets think they're getting for free, they actually are paying for out of their paycheck. They just never see it because they're paid. These things come out. They get a little bit of money paid over in their bank account every month. Uh, but yeah, on average, the easiest way to explain it is cadets are paid about $1,100 a month in base pay, and then they actually get, uh, again, the allotment's taken out. So about $400 to $450 goes towards that initial $10,000 loan, if you will. Um, then they pay about another $100 to $150 in other fees. So I think fourth class can usually expect, and if there are any parents or anybody online, maybe you can validate this, but I think a fourth class cadet can expect to see, you know, approximately three to four hundred dollars direct deposited into their bank account, you know, every month. Um, that obviously is going to decrease or excuse me, what they owe is going to decrease. So what they see in their paycheck is going to increase the longer they're here at the academy. So third class cadets are probably making a little bit more. Maybe they're seeing, you know, five hundred dollars a month. But then by the time they get to second class and first class year, they've kind of paid off that initial loan. They have all their uniforms. You know, they have, for the most part, all their academic stuff they need. So they're probably seeing pretty close to, you know, seven, maybe even $800 um, directly in their paycheck each month, really just, you know, paying taxes and some of those other fees. Great. Um, I'll ask uh, Chris to go on. So that'll conclude our training for this afternoon. Um, if there are any last minute uh, questions, as always, our emails are open. Uh, so please send us uh, any additional responses uh, or ideas for additional trainings. Uh, we greatly appreciate everyone's participation today. A big thank you to Mr. Chris McMunn for being here as well. Um, and we look forward to our next uh, webinar that will be coming up next month. So be on the lookout for those dates. Go online, register, tell others how great these are. Uh, we'd like to see the participation increase, of course, uh, always, and uh, have a great day. Go Bears!